Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this third Sunday of Advent, December 17th. It is this, um, the Sunday of joy, and the color is pink. We take a break from the um, scripture readings about this uh, kind of apocalyptic uh, future, and we focus on, um, on joy and what brings us joy. We're going to be looking at a story about John the Baptist, who, of course, uh, is the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, and he has to defend that uh, uh, position that he claims to behold. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that and also about what the wilderness looks like for us today. So we're going to begin worship this morning with the prelude in the bleak midwinter. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 4 and 8 through 11. The, Lord of the, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that the captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come, and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, 
repairing cities destroyed long ago. They will revive them, though they have been deserted for many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully reward my people for their suffering and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be recognized and honored among the nations. Everyone will realize that the people, they, they are a people the Lord has blessed. I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God. For he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding or a bride with her jewels. The sovereign Lord will show his justice to the nations of the world. Everyone will praise him. His righteousness will be like a garden in the early spring with plants springing up everywhere. Please join me in the opening prayer. God of grace, grant us the patience to wait with joyful hearts for the wisdom to stand to help shed the light of your love to a more just and verdant world. Let us affirm with hope, peace, joy, and love in our hearts Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Amen. Please join us in singing Come Thou Expected Jesus. Please stand. <laughs> Jesus. Please remain standing for our prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our New Testament reading is from John chapter 1, verses 6, verses 6 through 8 and 19 through 28. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply the witness to tell about the light. This was John's testimony. When the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you? He came right out and said, I am not the Messiah. Well then, who are you? They asked. Are you Elijah? No, he replied. Are you the prophet we are expecting? No. Then who are you? We need an answer for those who sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? John replied in the words of the prophet Isaiah. I am a voice shouting in the wilderness, clear the way for the Lord's coming. 
Then the Pharisees who had been sent asked him, If you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet, what right do you have to baptize? John told them, I baptize with water, but right here in the crowd is someone you do not recognize. Though his ministry follows mine, I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandal. This encounter took place in Bethany, an area east of the Jordan River where John was baptizing. Thanks be to God. Be Amen. seated. Please be seated. I'm not sure um, Advent would be Advent uh, without John the Baptist. We hear a lot about John the Baptist this time of year, this time of waiting and watching and preparing, and it extends even into January. John was this herald who identified himself as one of Isaiah's who in Isaiah's prophecy proclaimed that I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, clear the way for the Lord's coming. Now it's interesting that Isaiah is the same prophet who will also proclaim next Sunday, a child will be born to us, a son given to us. And he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You could say that Isaiah was John the Baptist's go-to prophet. And John had some important things to proclaim to not only the people who came to the River Jordan to be baptized, but to those priests and temple assistants, and also to us. John is saying that we could be challenged by others for our faith. We could be tempted by and repent of misplaced priorities. We could always be dismissed as a religious fanatic. We could be lured by cultural idols and fascinated by consumerism. Those are all types of wilderness experiences. But then John also teaches us that humility is a cornerstone of our faith expression. Now, humility is um, understood as kind of this modest or very low view of one's own importance. Now, John knew he wasn't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet that they were expecting. And as a matter of fact, his own importance wasn't the issue. It was the one to come. That was the most important person. And then John teaches us about light. In order for us to be a light, we must follow the light. And John, in his own way, lit this pathway for those to find their way to Jesus. He wasn't the light. He was the one who followed it, leading others along the way. So if we look at those three Advent points, we can ask, who challenges our faith? What are our misplaced priorities? And can we name a cultural idol that lures us into the wilderness? John the Baptist says that we are to be the ones who are now the messengers, who proclaim the coming of Jesus into our hearts as a way to break free of the wilderness. Level those obstacles that interfere with our faith journeys. 
make straight a way from our heart to God's heart. But here's the thing. None of this is new, right? This isn't your first Advent for most of you or joining us online. We pretty much go over this same interpretation year after year, Advent after Advent. Hope, peace, joy, they prepare us for the coming of Christ. But what I'm questioning today and maybe just a statement more than a question, is about taking very seriously what it means to be a messenger of the one to come. How do we deal with those challenges to our faith? Are we humble? And those cultural idols that we could name, do they ever get explored within the context of our faith? Our faith journeys are always to be an exercise in optimism and hope. And here's some of the reasons I have hope. We play a numbers game at church, and it's not just this church. Our denomination plays a numbers game. And during COVID, our online viewing, of course, went off the charts. We're back to a a regular, I guess, regular um, Sunday attendance, doubling it more, more than doubling it from online people. And what I take from those numbers that we collect every week, I take that to mean that there is a hunger to sustain the faith in such alluring and disillusioning times. Then we have generosity and giving. It's clearly a priority for people. I interpret that to mean that there's a hunger to share the ability to ease the suffering of others. And it takes tremendous humility to forget oneself in this season in order to help others. Love and care for one another is also very fulfilling. But lately, it's been a very reassuring aspect of our communal faith. Caring for one another dismisses those cultural idols and places consumerism at a place of low priority because we care about others more. So we're not lost. We may be wandering around a little bit in the wilderness, but we, it is not a drift of hope and peace. And what we have found is how outside the wilderness of isolation and idle distractions and life challenges, we find joy. There's joy in loving and caring for others. There's joy in thinking of ourselves as less important in order to help others. And there's joy in knowing that our faith withstands the pressures of challenges. John proclaimed the coming of the one, Isaiah said, would watch over the people like a shepherd making sure that the one who gets lost is no less important than the 99 others. Isaiah describes this shepherd as one who would lead his flocks to green pastures and carry the lambs on his shoulders. You've heard of the expression that if you really want to get people's attention, Isaiah's Messiah whispers his way into the hearts of people. And for those who feel threatened by what he whispers, 
his words probably seem more like a shout. Whether preaching or prophesying or singing, the word of one, the word of the one to come must cause people to stop and listen. To question one's own faith. And if there's anything in the world that should be alluring, it must be the love of Jesus. And so our job as faithful witnesses who watch and wait and prepare for what is to come is to also proclaim it. Shout if you must, but all it really takes is a well-directed whisper. John's, John the Baptist's testimony um, really spoke for itself, and he relied heavily on Isaiah's image of the one to come. And so here we are, fast approaching those heralding angels, singing glory to the newborn king, peace on earth, mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. For the gospel writer, John, John the Baptist never heard the newborn king crying in the manger. He only knew that he was the messenger of the one who pointed to the manger. John may be only the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, may be humble enough to know his place, yet mindful enough of his own role in the salvation of the world. It was never about John. It was always about Jesus. And it's the same for us. It's never about you and I. It's always about Jesus. And in these days of individualistic priorities and less about the poor and the brokenhearted and oppressed. These are extremely humbling readings in the context of our own wilderness lives. And sometimes you got to wonder, is it really that we are being held captive by the wilderness as much as we are captivated by it? Not held captives against our will, but willingly go into its isolation. And the wilderness for Isaiah was not a place near to the heart of God, but a place of distance and hunger, temptations. And our wilderness allows us to not be bothered by those deep abiding care for the world or for the earth or for one another. And I guess that holds an allure in itself a self. And it weren't, if it weren't for Jesus, we might be tempted as well. So the problem, of course, with this kind of world that it is encased in darkness, the kind of darkness that Isaiah prophesies about and which we will hear about on Christmas Eve, it's not enough to know that darkness exists. One must also watch for when darkness enters our souls. And that's what the love of Christ does for us. It keeps the dark out. Here we are, ready and willing to take on the life that reflects the light of Christ. Not just this year, but the next and the next. No matter how many times we are confronted with Advent and the coming of Christ, we are ready and willing. 
We never get tired of singing those Christmas carols while at the same time wrestle with the apocalypse. That's the life we lead and whose hand of Jesus touches us to the core. And this is another Advent Sunday when we deliberately choose light over darkness, truth over deception, and humility over the temptations of idols and consumerism. But rather than skip over Advent and overindulge in Christmas cookies and hot toddies, we're going to stand to sing Hark. The herald angels sing as our commitment to those who challenge. It's the Sunday of joy. When we layer on hope and peace to joy, we can begin to hear that faint chorus of heralding angels. The angels are beginning to sing. Can you hear them? In the background of the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Marsha Riggs says believers have a responsibility both to be persons who reflect the light of Christ and to live in such a way our lives proclaim the light of Christ in the world. It's a huge responsibility. We must be humbled by it, encouraged into it, and to live with the sheer joy of both shouting and singing. Thanks be to God. Amen. So I spoke to Jesus last night when I needed to get to sleep. Uh, I get there in my secret place, but it's just me and Jesus. And I was down, all in my feelings, low, vulnerable. And this guy's amazing. This is what I told him right here. Before I bring my need, I will lift my heart. Before I lift my cares, I will lift my arms. I want to know you, I want to find you in every season, in every moment. Before I bring my cares, I will lift my heart and seek you first. I want to seek you, I want to seek you first. More than anything I want, I want you first. Before I speak a word, let me hear your voice. And in the midst of pain, let me feel your joy. Ooh, I want to know you, I want to find you in every season, in every moment. Before I speak a word, I will bring my heart and seek you first. I want to seek you, I want to seek you first. I want to keep you, I want to keep you first. More than anything, 
everything I want. I want you first. You are my treasure and my reward. Let nothing ever come. Before we start our prayer, we do have um, some prayer requests from today. Um, we pray for Christina Parker's friend, Michelle, who has pneumonia, and for her friend, Kathy, who has dementia. So prayers also for Kathy's husband, Don. Uh, we pray for Margaret Scott's friend, Gary, recovering from surgery for a pacemaker, and another friend, Martha, who's having hip surgery tomorrow. We have continued prayers for Mark Sewell as he continues to recover from the stroke at home. Prayers of healing for all those who are ill, living with chronic pain, hospitalized, or recovering. Um, we have an additional prayer for Holly's brother-in-law, Kevin, who was recently diagnosed with cancer. Um, prayers of thanks that uh, mother-in-law, Joe Foost, is doing much better this week, so that's wonderful. And prayers for Tim as he drives home from Michigan today, getting through rain and Buffalo Bills traffic. <laughs> that, is, that is a good prayer. <laughs> um, in this season of holiday joy, we pray for the lonely, the depressed, and those who are struggling to stay in recovery. Um, for her, from our friends who came for food this Sunday morning, we have prayers for Kevin, Loreen, Nikki, and Karen. Our prayer this morning will go with Lead Me, Lord. Let us be in a spirit of prayer that God may lead us on our way as individuals and as a community. Lead me, Lord, lead me in your righteousness. Make your way plain before my face, for it is you, Lord, only you, that makes me dwell in safety. God of the ages, you have often sent your messengers to us, like John the Baptizer, and Jesus, and his disciples, and all who have given us messages of your way. But your way isn't always clear to us, and more than it was for them, so we let go our control, and ask you to lead us in your way of justice, righteousness, and peace. We pray for all the places of division and conflict in our world. Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, 
Lead us into understanding of those who are different, who think and believe differently, who li whose lives we don't really know, let alone understand. Let us be deep listeners, wise speakers, and large-hearted lovers. God of the present age, lead us in concern for those who are hurting, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. Lead us into compassion and presence. Show us how to be your hands and feet for them. God of the future, lead us into trust. Fill our wells of hope. Encompass our hearts with peace and ignite our sparks of joy. That we may be your presence in your own circles, in our own unique ways you call us. For we pray in the spirit of Jesus, daring to call you our Father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. As we prepare for our time of giving to God is one of the ways that we give back um, in honor of all the blessings that have bestowed upon us. We have a few announcements this morning. Uh, Reading on the Rock uh, for Advent continues tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, and we are going to be reading an old um, story by the Brothers Grimm called The Falling Stars. It's a, little, it's a story about a little girl who um, tr puts her trust in God and goes out into the world and finds blessings raining down upon her. So that'll be tomorrow night. On Christmas Eve, next Sunday in the morning, 10 o'clock, we will have our fourth Sunday of Advent worship service and then gather again at 7 o'clock for our candlelight Christmas Eve service. Our New Year's Day spaghetti dinner is a go. Thank you so much for all those generous donations. Uh, we will be able to, yes, I'm telling you, it's, you, you came through. Um, as a matter of fact, one came this morning in today, or last week's mail from out of state. So thank you for people online who are listening to these announcements. Um, so that di a spaghetti dinner will be held New Year's Day from 2 to 4. It's a little bit of change this year. We won't go until 5 o'clock. But we do need volunteers to set up and, um, and to serve and to be just a hospitable presence for our guests. But in order for us to just be able, thank you, provide them the most delicious spaghetti dinner in town, we're going to make the meatballs on uh, Saturday, December 30th, after we've um, done the Wegmans run, so it'll probably be around 10.30. So if you want it, it's a lot of fun, and we do um, get as much um, hard work done as we do giggling. So it's, it's, a, it's a fun time if you want to join us Saturday morning, December 30th, around 10.30. So for all these blessings that have just rained down upon us, I invite you to stand and praise God from whom all blessings flow.
God of hope and peace and joy. We offer these gifts to you to bless in order that we may use them uh, to make sure that Jesus is known as the light of the world here in this place. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to remain standing for Hark! The Herald Angels Sing. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord is upon us and has anointed us to bring good news to the poor, sent us to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. May it be so, and the people of God say, Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated for the organ postlude, Break Forth, O Beauteous Heavenly Light. <laughs> 